So, welcome to the afternoon session. I hope you had a nice lunch time or whatever, depending on time zone. I started programming when I was 11 years old. Really long ago. And, and today, today we have, we have Kautilia. Kautilia. He is, he is seven, seven years, years old. old. Is that, is true? that true? Yeah. Welcome, Welcome to, to your Python. And, and, and uh, give you give the, word the word about, about computational, computational complexity. complexity. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Cortina. Hello. Hi. My name is Cortilia and today we're going to talk about computational complexity. As you already know my name, I am a seven year old computing explorer and problem solver. And I am a seven and and here on the screen you can see me installing Python when I was around five and a half. And I hold the Guinness World Record title for youngest computer programmer at the age of six. I knew different kinds of algorithms even before I started coding and I have a special love for puzzles and solving problems. So due to lockdown I got bored at home so I discovered how to slide on the stairs and I used a piece of cardboard, a mattress or some pillows. By the way, the pillow thing was unsuccessful. I advise you to not use pillows. The mattress was rocking. Here's a few second video of me sliding. Go! I hope you like it. I still had lots of time, so here's how I utilised it. I used online computing resources from YouTube and courses from Stanford, MIT and I learned about artificial intelligence from IBM and in fact I am an IBM certified AI professional. I also explored data science series and learned how to do data analysis and visualization using Python from IBM. But my most important achievement of the year is in the next slide. So, so here on the screen is... So about last week I got my most important academic certificate. And here on the screen is my year 2 progress report for my primary school. I did pretty good and now excited to move to year three. I also love doing mathematics, swimming, origami, cycling, reading and playing with my friends and younger brother. So, so what are algorithms? Algorithms are basically a self instructions and they can be very simple, like just eating an ice lolly. So number one, open the freezer. Number two, take out... So number one, open the freezer. Number two, take out the ice lolly. Number three, close the freezer. And number four, eat the ice lolly. And they can also be very hard, like making a map of the Andromeda galaxy with one of those early telescopes which could only look as far as the Andromeda galaxy. I think the universe also has an algorithm to expand. We just don't know it yet. But they are all around us and we just keep discovering them. Now since we didn't make the universe, let's forget about that for a bit. When we made computers, machines, AI technology. So let's talk about algorithms using programs. So now, to understand computational complexity, you first have to understand big O notation. And big O notation 
I click all of computational complexity is nothing but forget about small and think big. And it's simple because it's just the way to represent something. But what is that something? Let's look at some examples to understand that. So let's say I am in the library to find my favourite Sherlock Puzzles book. Then I could just ask the librarian and he or she will give it to me. That would be order of one time complexity because I'm doing only one step. And that one step is asking the librarian. And also, the time taken will obviously depend on how fast the librarian is, but that might relate to space complexity, which is how much memory it takes, which we're not going into in details. In this example, let's say there are no librarians but I still need to find my book. Then I could start searching one by one in all the racks until I find it. That would be all just one time complexity because I'm doing only one step, which is asking the librarian. Obviously the time taken will depend on how fast the librarian is, but that might relate to space complexity. Oh uh, wait, no, I think. And because at max I'm doing n steps, so and and at max I mean when the book is at the end of the library. So at max you're doing n steps. So in total you have all of n time complexity, even though that might not be exactly n steps. In this example, let's say the box are this time arranged in alphabetical order, so A to Z. Then, then linear search is still applicable, but there is a more efficient method, and it is called binary search. So how binary search works is by it keeps on splitting the box into half until it finds it and, and that is a divide and conquer algorithm i mean that is exactly what a divide and conquer algorithm does divide conquer combine now so it's also one of the divide and conquer algorithms okay anyway let's just go back to binary research so sherlock puzzles book starts with an s the middle letter in the alphabet is M, and S comes after M. So we just need to look for box M to Z. And then keep on splitting the box into half until you find it. That would be all just log N time complexity, because log is the number of times you can divide it by 2. Divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2. I mean, divided by two without getting a one, and I mean, a one in the integer place. Now we know what big O notation is. I told you it's simple. We also know what algorithm means. The steps the program takes. I mean, a combination of the steps the program takes. But the efficiency of the algorithm depends on how many steps you're taking, if we're talking about time complexity, or how much memory it takes, if we're talking about space complexity. But how do we calculate time complexity or space complexity? Let's understand that with a simple program. So here on the screen, you can see a simple program to calculate sum of numbers till n. This algorithm involves one step to initialize care zero. Then in the for loop, there are three operations running n times. 
And finally, the last line of the program is a number operation. So in total, you have 1 plus 3n plus 1 operations. But when we talk about big numbers, like a million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, how do small numbers make any difference? They don't. We can ignore all the con additive constants, which will make the expression 3n, and then remove the multiplicative, multiplicative factors as well, which will make the expression only n. And then you have your time complexity as order of n. I'm going to say the same thing I said a few minutes ago. Yeah, a few minutes ago. Time complexity is nothing but forget about small and think big. Now, no bigger presentation should be done without showing this graph which is showing the time complexity of different algorithms and it gives the indication of how much proportional time it may take if the input size grows. So, as you can see in the graph, order of log n looks almost constant and shows the most efficient time complexity. Where well, I just want to say before I proceed to order of n that that the input size doesn't increase with the running time complexity. I mean, with the, the input size doesn't increase with the time, so the growth factor isn't the same. So now let's just move on to order of n. So order of n. So that is also quite efficient. But order of n log n, that's fair release, but I cannot say the same thing for n to power of a constant. And I definitely can't say the same thing for n factorial or a constant to power of n. But that's only true when we're talking about big inputs. When the inputs are more small, then n squared works the same same or even better than order of n but order of log n performs quite poorly for small inputs in case you're wondering my mom helped me draw these graphs initially i came up with this one So now let's talk about other kinds of asymptotic complexity. So let's go back to our library example where we're searching rack by rack, the linear search one. So here there could be n possibilities, but if I narrow them, narrow them down, then I could find in the first rack itself and that is best case which is called big omega notation and or i could find it i mean in this case it has omega of one or i could find it in the middle rack somewhere and that's average case which is called big theta notation and in and in our example it has theta of n because because of the way we calculate the time complexity um, and then also another possibility is that is that we can't you another possibility is that we can find in the last track or do not find that all in the whole library and that is the worst case which is big o notation which we already looked at, so it's all your fun. So there are also, so big O notation is an upper bound, big omega notation is a lower bound, and then big theta notation is an average bound. There are also two little notations, little omega and little o. 
They are little omega and little o. They are rough estimates of the upper or lower bounds. But they are not used as much as the big notations though. So, I got this data from one of the books about algorithms and it shows some interesting figures. As you can see, any algorithm with time complexity n factorial becomes useless after an input more than 20 for 2 to the power of n, that's 40. For n squared, that's a million, still much better than the other two but still bad. But n log n is quite good, and n is really good. But log n, that is the best. Only 0 0.03 nan microseconds for the input 1 billion. Some examples of log of n are binary search, Fibonacci search, and exponential search. Some radix or counting saw and bucket saw. These are nearly order of n, but not exactly. Linear search is exactly. Some for n log n are tensile mode or quicksort heap saw, and some other divide and conquer algorithms too. Some for n squared are by all sort selection sort, insertion sort, and stewed sort. For 2 graph n, it's the brute force for calculating the nth Fibonacci number. For n factorial, a great example for that would be Heap's algorithm, which is used for generating all the possible permutations of n objects. And we even have algorithms which have order of infinity time complexity. And one of these is Bogo sort. The way it works is by finding A, I didn't say another, I said A, even though that could have improved its time complexity to 2 to the power of n. A random permutation of the list if it finds out that the list is not sorted. So it creates through the list if the list if the left element is less than the right element then it finds a random permutation. Now let's look at some algorithms. So insertion sort is the first one. So the way it works is by marking the first element as sorted, then it goes through the array, I mean everything else in the array, then then it puts it where it should be in the sorted subarray. As you can see, 10 doesn't move because it's greater than 5, even though it's more than 7. Because I said sorted array. Okay, anyway. So after you after the whole sorted subarray, after the whole sorted array is in the sorted subarray, then it the then you just need to print out the, the sorted subarray. You should use insertion sort when the data is extremely small. In fact, it's even better than bubble sort for extremely small data. But you shouldn't use it if the data... I mean, another way you could use it is where the data is extremely large and almost sorted because it takes only one iteration of the list in its first case, which is omega of n. But you shouldn't use it if the list is unsorted to a large extent and also the data is and and also the data is big. And it does not perform well when the list is in reverse order. Its time complexity is order of n squared and space complexity is order of 1. Now mode sort. It keeps on splitting the data into half until you have equal sequences of length 1. And then merge them together and then you have a sorted array. The way merging works is so. 
So look at the first gen of both of them. So for 5, 10 and 2, 7, 8. 5 and 2, 2 is smaller, so put that in first. Then 7 and 5, 5 is smaller, so put that in next. Then 10, 10 and 7, 7 is smaller, put that in next. And then move on to 8, 8 and 10, 8 is smaller, so put that in next. And then, and then you're done with the second array. Now you just need to add on everything that's left. And so and 10 is left, so just add that on. You should even make a thought when the data is large but not too large. For C++ about more than 10 power 6 in size. And for Python that's 10 power 10 in size I think. More specific, I think it's more like 2 power 64 actually. Yeah, 2 power 64. Now Tim sort. So Tim sort is basically a combination of the first two. That's why I put the insertion to on there so I had the beginning. So Tim sort first analyzes the list, picks which one's better, insertion to on there sort, and that's how it works. You should use Tim sort when almost yeah when the day. You can use it everywhere, but but not more than 10 per 6 for C++ and 10 per 10 in size in Python again, because it uses mode sort. Okay, it's time complexity is all just n log n, and it's space complexity is all just n. And now binary search. You should use it when the data is sorted and it doesn't work when the data isn't sorted. It's time complexity, I already told you, log of n, and it's space complexity, or just one. And interpolation search. The only difference of it from binary search is that I divide into unequal parts. So, so what happens is that so what happens is that it it goes more at the end if the element is closer to the last element. It goes more at the start if the element's small at the start, basically. I mean, at least it does that for sorted and uniformly distributed lists or arrays, which one you prefer. I mean, whatever one you prefer. And it's actually feet off log log n well and it's and that case is when the data is sorted and uniformly distributed you shouldn't you should use it when it is and you shouldn't use it when it isn't sorted or uniformly distributed it's time complexity is all just n and it's space complexity is all just one Okay, so that's the end of my show. I have a few accounts where I'd li love to connect with you. And I also have a YouTube channel called Cortilia Concepts, where I post videos about how to solve different computing problems. You can search it by the keyword Cortilia Concepts Python though. It doesn't work when you search Cortilia Concepts. Thank you, Q&A. Thank you, No, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. There are some questions. Let me start with the first one. Um, did you implement different sorting algorithms in Python and measure time using, for example, the time module? Uh, I think I have I've done it a long time ago for Bogo sort and Bogo sort and mode sort, I think, and maybe even and maybe in session sort too. 
So the next question is, how did you learn Python? What do you recommend to get started? So I learned Python when, so, so it's a bit, so it was a bit like a mistake, just a good mistake. So it's when my dad gave, it all started when my dad gave me this book about computing and I just loved it so much. I finished it all in only one day and and also and also I actually built some basic computer programs and and also I recommend that I recommend that you should first start by reading books and then when you're okay with that then start practicing and solving problems uh, and I recommend and I also recommend to solve puzzles that because that might help you too. Yes, that sure helps. By the way, I started programming too with a book. <laughs> That's the best way. Um, so the next question is, what is the hardest algorithm you have come up personally and what challenge was there? Um, I don't think I know what you mean. Yeah, let me um, actually the person who asked should do that. But I think is maybe you programmed something that was really, really hard and and um, maybe you, you had some problems or something when programming and, and how did you solve it? Um, I didn't have much challenges because my mom mostly helped me for to solve some problems. To solve most problems. Okay, that's great. So, so let's look if there are more questions. No, at the moment there are no more questions coming in. So thank you very much again. It was really a pleasure, and I think think you are the youngest Euro Python speaker ever. So thank you very much.